Our scripture for this morning is Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 22. Let us listen to God's word to us this day. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all the peoples as it is today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have heard the story once already, and uh, we'll hear again this familiar scripture passage. But perhaps hearing again will help us to pay attention, to really pay attention. Let us listen now to God's word. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was, but when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days' worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. By a show of hands or comments online, how many of you have ever been stranded on the side of the road? Yeah? I have been many times, unfortunately. And it's never fun. 
But one of the worst times was when it wasn't just me, but it was me and two other adults and a group of middle schoolers en route on a mission trip from our church in Kentucky down to Chattanooga, Tennessee. We hadn't even hit the state line yet when we blew a tire on the old church van. It was a miracle we didn't crash. Another miracle that we were on a very small stretch of that particular part of I-75 that wasn't sandwiched in between steep rocks going up on one side and down on the other. Once the van was safely on the shoulder, we quickly evacuated the youth and sent them to sit uh, in the shade of a large tree a safe distance from the road. Well, the jack was bad, the bolts were rusty, and after working after uh, a full hour in the full sun on a 100 degree day on the side of the interstate, one of the chaperones remembered that she had roadside assistance. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 30 minutes later, we were back on the road going much slower with three tires and a donut. Just north of Knoxville, we felt the van lurch once again as one of the good tires shredded. At that point, we were really stranded. It was getting dark. We were hours from home and hours from our destination, and we had an old church van with two blown tires and one old donut. Well, the kids got to see the Connectional Church at work that day. After a few phone calls, we connected with a retired couple who lived close to where we had broken down, and they quickly came to the rescue loading up our luggage and everybody and driving us over to their two-bedroom retirement condo where they proceeded to order pizza and clear surfaces that could be used for sleeping. The next morning, the husband helped us figure out getting the van's very old tires replaced, and his wife made us a pancake breakfast. And finally, we arrived at our destination later that afternoon, a day late and a few dollars shorter. So the thing is, <laughs> just a couple of hours before that first flat tire, I had been preaching on the Good Samaritan. And I challenged the congregation regarding the evergreen desire to attract more young people and rather, seeing them, rather than seeing them as new blood or part of a fresh recruitment pool, I said, this is the ministry field. As long as we were waiting for young people to come, and, and f to come to us and fill the volunteer needs and pad the coffers, we were missing the need and the opportunity that was right in front of us. It was a sermon that one member told me later didn't step on their toes, but reminded them of where their feet ended. <laughs> I compared the youth and the young people in the community to that man in need on the side of the road, and never before has a sermon come back quite so quickly to haunt me. <laughs> back on that interstate, we couldn't believe how many drivers passed the clearly marked church van and the obvious signs that these children needed help. Maybe they were busy and running late on a Sunday afternoon. Maybe they were afraid of middle schoolers. <laughs> Maybe they had skipped church and they'd missed the rousing sermon that would have inspired them to stop and do the right thing. This is one of the most familiar parables that Jesus tells, and I'm sure you've heard it before, along with the many good reasons the priest and Levite may have had for crossing to the other side of the road. And Jesus didn't condemn them for doing that. This isn't the parable of the bad priest and Levite. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan a term that would have sounded like an oxymoron to Jesus' audience. The Jews and Samaritans were as different and at odds with each other as Jews and Palestinians in the Gaza Strip today. They were as opposed as Proud Boys and Antifa, as divided as the factions that we regularly see these days in so many areas of life over gun regulation, CRT, immigration, the humanity of different people, politics, and so much more. 
That is to say, there was no love lost between the Jews and Samaritans. A Samaritan showing up in Jesus' parable was a plot twist, but the fact that he also was the one who did the right thing, the one who had the least obligation to help, well, when Jesus asks this rhetorical question at the end of the story, the man can't even answer plainly. He could have said the Samaritan was the neighbor, but instead, the one who showed mercy. This summer, as we enter the neighborhood, we start with the same question. Who is our neighbor? Over the course of his decades on television, Mr. Rogers met countless neighbors on his show. Some of them he invited into his home and others he went to visit in their homes or in their places of business. Like the Samaritan, Mr. Rogers crossed boundaries of social propriety, most famously when he invited Officer Clemens to come and sit and refresh himself by putting his feet in the same kiddie pool. In ways big and small, Mr. Rogers was always expanding the definition of a neighbor. In the very first episode of the syndicated show, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers invited, visited a neighbor who had quite the collection of lampshades. That's what we hear when he first goes to her house. And then as he asks to see them, she proudly starts displaying them on her head as hats. Now, some may have scoffed at this eccentricity, but Mr. Rogers asks questions to learn more. And later that week, he invites some children and their music teacher into his home, including two young black boys. This was in 1968, just a few months before the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In the first week in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, we learned to be curious about our neighbors, to explore the things that make us different and unique, and to appreciate them. That curiosity and that openness was a hallmark of Mr. Rogers' approach to others, both on the show and off. He was genuinely interested in getting to know people who were very different from him. And one of the ways that he did this was by slowing down. On that very first show, we also met Mr. McFeely for the first time, who can't stand still. He's very busy. He's got a speedy delivery. He's got lots of speedy deliveries to make. Can't stop to chat. Keeps interrupting Mr. Rogers to cut to the chase. The message that he has to deliver is from the lampshade neighbor, who is uh, unable to come visit Mr. Rogers, as she had said she might do. She's simply too busy also. So he goes to see her instead. Although summer is often busy with travel and with other plans, it also affords us, hopefully, some opportunities to slow down. I'm afraid that some of my least neighborly thoughts happen when I'm behind the wheel. I'm sure I'm alone in that. <laughs> Maybe it's a challenge for me because I'm usually cutting time so close either because I've scheduled too many things or because I'm trying to squeeze one more thing in before I have to get on the road. When I'm in a hurry, I'm not such a great neighbor. It was easy to judge the many vehicles that flew past our van on that hot July afternoon, but it's also likely that a number of those folks that were driving past were driving so fast they didn't register that they had passed a need until they were down the road. And at that point, maybe a few even sent a prayer our way, but figured it didn't make sense to turn around. I'm not going to urge driving slow on the interstate, <laughs> but maybe there are other ways that we can slow down and live into being good neighbors. When we slow down, we see more of what's around us, it's one of the reasons that we're walking together on Wednesdays, to get to see and know our neighborhood and our neighbors a little better. Last week, we walked down a cul-de-sac across High Street. I don't even know the name. It didn't have a street sign. And while we were admiring a beautiful garden, a woman came out of her house, 
waving and smiling at us while her grandson ventured out on a riding toy. And we shared a conversation as much as a group of English speakers and someone who didn't speak any English could. It was a lovely interaction. Beautiful things can happen when you slow down. Even if we can't totally dial down the pace of life, we can still be intentional in our interactions with others. When we ask questions and we start to get to know other people better, we can be better neighbors. And we can learn more ways about building a better neighborhood together. From the story of the Good Samaritan, we could distill a simple moral to help those in need, even when or especially when they're different from us. But the question asked was, who is my neighbor? And the answer is the Samaritan, the one who stopped to help. Our neighbor is endowed with gifts to offer. And part of loving our neighbor is in receiving those gifts. True neighbors break down the barriers of us and them, of helper and of one in need. True neighbors recognize that both parties have something to give as well as needs to be met. And in a neighborhood, these gifts and needs meet in a mutual web of caring and support. Some neighborhoods still function like this, but I think that's less common than it used to be. We might build our villages beyond geographic bounds these days to especially include those who have similar interests or lifestyles or stages of life. And that kind of capital has a lot of value that help that we offer each other. And not everyone has access to it. A few months ago, Chris Hoover Seidel was here to share with us about the work of Bridge of Hope. Bridge of Hope works with single moms who are facing housing insecurity and provides support and resources for a better and more secure future for their families. One of the cornerstones of Bridge of Hope is the neighboring group made up of six to eight volunteers, usually a group from a single church, who receive training and then accompany the family through the Bridge of Hope program for up to two years. This isn't helping. It's building relationships. Trinity has done this in the past, and some of our members are still in contact with the neighbors from that time. And right now, as you heard it during announcements, there is an urgent need for a neighboring group to be trained and ready to start in July. Whether or not we have a full group from Trinity, if you are interested, you can talk more to me or let Victoria know or reach out directly to Chris. This request came to me last week and it felt just a little bit relevant to our story today. That might not be the thing for you right now. And the good news is, that you don't have to add on to your plate in order to be a good neighbor. When we slow down, when we ask questions, when we get to know our neighbors, we learn better how to love them. When it comes to being good neighbors, there's no one size fits all. My hope and prayer for us, for all of us this summer, is that we can grow as neighbors in this community of faith and in our church neighborhood and far beyond as our church extends far beyond our geographic area. May we slow down. May we practice curiosity. And may we build stronger webs of connection, even with and especially with those who are very different from us. Just please, don't go getting stranded on any roadsides today, okay? <laughs> Amen.